This is section 1.1, part C, organizing a statistical problem. As you learn more statistics, you will be asked to solve more complex problems. Although no single strategy will work on every problem, it might be helpful to have a general framework for organizing your thinking. Here is a four-step process you can follow. So the first thing you're going to do is you are going to state. This is where you want to know what question that you are trying to answer. Next, you are going to make a plan. This is where you find out how will you go about answering the questions. What statistical techniques does this problem call for? Next is the do part of the problem. This is where you make your graphs or carry out any needed calculations. And finally, you will conclude. You're going to give your practical conclusion in the setting of a real world problem. So this is where you take the calculations and you put them back into the setting of the problem. Many examples and exercises will tell you what to do. They'll tell you to construct a graph, perform a calculation, interpret a result, or so on. Real statistics problems do not come with such detailed instructions. From now on, you will encounter some problems and exercises that are more realistic. Use the four-step process as a guide to solve these problems as the following example illustrates. So once again, we are looking at the information from a survey where 19 to 25 year old males and females were asked the likelihood that they would have more than a middle class income by the time they were 30. Based on the survey data, can we conclude that young men and women differ in their opinion about the likelihood of future wealth? Give appropriate evidence to support your answer, and we need to follow the four-step process. So the first thing we need to do is state what problem we're trying to solve. So state, what is the relationship between gender and response to the question, what do you think are the chances you will have much more than middle class income at age 30? So by writing this out, Either you or the person grading this problem will know exactly what answer you are trying to solve. So the next thing you need to do is you need to make a plan. Now, it is possible that you already suspect that there is one way it's going to lean. So we suspect that gender might influence young adults' opinions. So we are going to compare the conditional distributions for men alone and for women alone. So we would make a plan, and then we would actually do the calculations and compare them with some type of graph if we wanted to do that. So among females, we looked at what percent said almost no chance. So of just the females, remember there was 2,367 females who were surveyed, 4.1% thought that they would have almost no chance, while 4% of the men who were surveyed thought they would have almost no chance. Some chance, 18% of the females said that when only 11.6% of the males. We get to 50-50, they're almost identical at 29.4 and 29.3. Had a good chance, the men start getting higher and then almost certain the male's bar graph is also higher on that one. So on the do, this is just where you're gonna do those calculations, you're going to make the graph. Then when you get to the last step, which is conclude, that's when you are going to interpret these results back into the context of the problem. So based on the sample data, men seem somewhat more optimistic about their future income than women. Men were less likely to say that they have some chance, but probably not, than women at 11.6% versus 18%. Men were more likely to say that they have a good chance at 30.8% versus 28.8% for female or almost certain, where males were at 24.3% versus females 20.5%, to have much more than a middle class income by the age of 30 than women were. So again, this conclusion is just pulling all the information back together and explaining out of the work I did, this is the conclusion I reached, and you're gonna bring that back to the original problem that was solved. We say that there is an association between two variables if specific values of one variable tend to occur in common with specific values of the other. 
In that previous example, the graph provides evidence of an association between gender and opinion about future wealth in the sample of young adults. What this means is the values of one variable, the opinion, tend to occur more or less frequently in combination with specific values of the other variable, which is gender. Now we say this is an association. We do not say that one causes the other. We don't say that the gender causes the opinion to be different. We just say that there is an association. More men often rated their chances of becoming rich in the two highest categories. Women said some chance, but probably not more frequently than men. Can we say that there is an association between gender and opinion in the population of young adults? Making this determination requires formal inference, which you're not going to get to for a couple of chapters. So right now we can just say there's an association between the two genders of the sample that we took, but we cannot generalize this for the entire population of young adults. You need to be cautious. There's one caution that we need to offer. Even a strong association between two categorical variables can be influenced by other variables lurking in the background. So let's take a look at the Titanic. In 1912, the luxury liner Titanic, on its first voyage across the Atlantic, struck an iceberg and sank. Some passengers got off the ship in lifeboats, but many died. The two-way table below gives information about adult passengers who lived and who died by class of travel. Now, if you look at this, it appears that of the first class passengers, more people survived than died. But if you look at second class or third class, they had more people die than they had survive. But if we break this down and look at it a different way, if we look at class and gender, now of the first class females, almost all of them survived and very, very few died. But if we look at the males who were first class passengers, they definitely had more die than they had survive. So is it class or is it gender that has more effect on this? The movie Titanic starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet suggested the following, that first class passengers received special treatment in boarding the lifeboats, while some other passengers were prevented from doing so, especially third class passengers. They also depicted that women and children boarded the lifeboats first, followed by the men. So what do the data tell us about these two suggestions? Give appropriate graphical and numerical evidence to support your answers. So let's just look at class first. If we just look at class of the first class passengers, 61.8% survived, while 38.2% died. Second class passengers, 36% survived and 64% died. And of the third class passengers, 24.1% survived, while 75.9% died. So from this data, it does suggest that first class passengers did receive special treatment in boarding the lifeboats. Because 61.8% of the first class passengers survived, and only 24.1% of the third class passengers survived. But the movie also suggests that women and children boarded the lifeboats first, and then it was followed by the men. So let's see if that is actually accurate. So if we look at male and female survival rates and compare them by class, of the males in first class, only 32.6% survived, while 97.2% of the females survived. In the second class, only 8.3% of the male population survived, while 86% of the female population survived. In third class, 16.2% of the male population survived and 46.1% of the female population. And again, we can compare this with a side-by-side -side bar graph. From the data, it does suggest that women did receive preferential treatment in getting into the lifeboats but the suggestion that all women and children were put in lifeboats before men is incorrect, since only 46.1% of the third class passengers who were female actually survived, and a very similar number, a very close number, of 32.6% of first class male passengers survived. 
Now, how does gender affect the relationship between class of travel and survival status? So again, let's look at the table that was already made of class and whether they are male or female. So as was seen in the previous example, gender seems to affect the relationship between class of travel and survival status. Of the first class passengers, 32.6% of men survived versus 97.2% of the females. So the females definitely had a better survival rate than the men. In the three classes, the percent of females who survived was much higher than the males who survived in each of the classes. But as you can tell, the percent of females fell with each class. In the most extreme cases, it is possible that an association between two categorical variables to be reversed when we consider a third variable. Here is an example that demonstrates the surprises that can await the unsuspecting user of data. So accident victims are sometimes taken by helicopter from the accident scene to a hospital. Helicopters save time, but do they also save lives? Let's compare the percent of accident victims who died with helicopter evacuation and with the usual transport to a hospital by car or on the road. Here are hypothetical data that illustrate a practical difficulty. So if we look, there are total 1,300 people that were transported. Of those, there were helicopter patients and there were people that were taken on the road. Now, of those that were taken on the helicopter, 64 out of the 200, which is 32%, died, which means that only 68% of them survived. And if we look at the road, those percents are going to be a lot different. So on the road, 260 out of the 1,110 died, and that's only 26%. So could there be an explanation for the lower survival rate of patients who were sent to the hospital by helicopter? The explanation is that the helicopter is sent mostly to serious accidents. So that the victims transported by helicopter are more often serious injuries. They are more likely to die with or without the helicopter evacuation. Here are the same data if we broke it down by the seriousness of the accidents. So of the serious accidents, we only look at the serious accidents, there's only 200 total serious accidents. If half of them are transported by helicopter and half are transported by the, on road, 48% of the serious cases that are transported by helicopter do not survive, while 60% of the serious cases that are transported on the road do not survive. So you can see by splitting up whether they're serious or less serious, there's going to be a very large difference. And of the less serious, 16 out of the 100 that are less serious die because they are transported by the helicopter, which is 16%, while 200 out of the 1,000 on the road, or 20%, will die if they are transported by an ambulance. So in this case, the survival rate is definitely better for serious accident patients and for less serious accident patients if they are transported by a helicopter because 52% of serious accident patients survive with helicopter while only 40% survive from an ambulance trip and 84% of less serious accidents survive by helicopter and only 80 that are transported by road. So both groups of victims have a higher survival rate when evacuated by helicopter. How can it happen that the helicopter does better for both groups of victims, but worse when all victims are lumped together? Examining the data makes the explanation clear. Half of the helicopter transported patients are from serious accidents compared with only 100 of the 1,110 road transport patients are serious. 
so the helicopter carries patients who are more likely to die. The seriousness of the accident was the lurking variable. That, until we uncovered it, hid the true relationship between survival and mode of transport into a hospital. This ex- this example illustrates Simpson's paradox. So when you hear Simpson's paradox, this is a phenomenon in statistics in which a trend appears in several different groups of data, but disappears or reverses when those groups are compared. Simpson's paradox reminds researchers that casual inferences, particularly in non-experimental studies, can be hazardous.